Welcome back to our IB Biology video series. This is the third video in IB Biology Topic 2, Molecular Biology, where we will be looking at proteins and enzymes. Proteins are a group of molecules composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen and sulphur. Each protein contains smaller building blocks known as amino acids which come in 20 different forms. Most living organisms use only these 20 amino acids to create the vast array of proteins that exist in our world. Only a very select group of organisms use 22 amino acids. The term given to all the proteins produced by the genetic information in an organism is the proteome. But what is an amino acid? An amino acid is composed of an amino and carboxyl group bound to a central carbon. This central carbon then has a hydrogen and variable R group attached. This R group simply stands for a variable side chain, which can be polar, nonpolar, or charged. Amino acids join by condensation, yet another anabolic reaction, to form polypeptides. Like with carbohydrates and lipids, you need to be comfortable drawing this process. So, draw two amino acids adjacent to one another. The OH group within the carboxyl group on one amino acid joins with the hydrogen within the amine group on the adjacent amino acid. This forms a peptide bond and water. If two amino acids join in this way, a dipeptide is formed. But if more than two join, a polypeptide is formed. There are six main functions that proteins can carry out. This can be remembered with the mnemonic Sir Rick, where S stands for spider silk, a fibrous protein stronger than steel and tougher than Kevlar. It contains regions of parallel polypeptides that extend when stretched, making it extensible and resistant to breaking. I stands for immunoglobulin, i.e. antibodies, which are proteins that bind to antigens in humans and form an immune response. R stands for rhodopsin, which is a membrane protein of rod cells that is surrounded by an opsin polypeptide. It absorbs light and generates an electrochemical response to create vision. R stands for rubisco, which is an enzyme that fixes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to enable carbon-based life. I stands for insulin, which is a hormone that signals glucose absorption from the blood. It's secreted by beta cells in the pancreas and converts glucose to glycogen. And C stands for collagen, which is a structural protein with a rope-like structure made of three polypeptides twisted together. It forms a mesh in skin, blood vessels, teeth and bones to prevent tearing and cracking. Obviously, these proteins are found in varying temperatures and pHs. And, understandably, they are affected by these conditions. You need to be comfortable explaining how, so let's cover this now. As temperature increases, heat causes vibrations which can disrupt the bonds present in a protein. Once the temperature passes the optimum temperature, the amino acid chain is disrupted and the protein changes shape, known as denaturation. As pH increases or decreases from the optimum, there is an increase in the hydroxide or hydrogen ion concentration, respectively. These ions disrupt the bonds in a protein and can also cause denaturation. In either situation, once denaturation has occurred, the protein is irreversibly changed and ceases all biological activity. But what is this activity that proteins carry out? Well, most proteins are enzymes. Enzymes speed up the rate of chemical reactions. They do this by lowering the energy required for the reaction to take place known as the activation energy, but they themselves are not altered in this process. 
the overall reaction is known as enzyme catalysis and can be outlined by the following stages. A substrate collides with an enzyme due to random continual motion of particles in the solution. The substrate binds to the enzyme at a location known as the active site. The substrate changes into different chemical substances, known as products, which then detach. It is important to note that the active site of an enzyme is very specific in both its shape and charge to the substrate. So, for a collision between an enzyme and substrate to be successful, they must be compatible in shape and charge, aligned and possess an energy greater than the activation energy. As you can imagine, adding enzymes to every solution means they're hard to remove. So, enzymes are often immobilized on surfaces so that they are reusable. This is incredibly useful industrially, for example, to produce lactose-free milk. The IB expects you to describe this process in detail, so let's cover it. Lactose is a disaccharide broken down by lactase into glucose and galactose. Some individuals lack lactase, so cannot break down the lactose. Instead, bacteria metabolize the lactose, causing flatulence, nausea and vomiting. In the production of lactose-free milk, lactase is added to milk, attached to alginate beads, or immobilized to the container. This is done so that the lactase breaks down any lactose present. It has several advantages. It can be drunk by lactose-intolerant individuals. It is sweeter, so requires less artificial sugars or sweeteners. It does not crystallize, so ice cream made is smoother in texture. It is fermented quicker, so it increases production speed of yogurt and cheese. All enzymes, immobilized or not, are affected by three key factors. Temperature, pH, and substrate concentration. Since enzymes are just proteins, these explanations are like those provided earlier in this video. For temperature, as temperature increases, kinetic energy increases, so the substrate and enzyme are more likely to collide. Therefore, the rate of enzyme catalysis increases, up to an optimum temperature. After this, kinetic energy becomes too great, and vibrations break the bonds in the enzyme, disrupting the shape of the active site and denaturing the enzyme. For pH, as pH increases or decreases from the optimum, there is an increase in the hydroxide ion or hydrogen ion concentrations respectively. These ions interact with polar and charged groups within amino acids of the enzyme, disrupting the shape of the active site and denaturing the enzyme. For substrate concentration, as substrate concentration increases, the likelihood of successful collisions increases so, enzyme activity increases. However, when the substrate binds to the enzyme, the active site is occupied for a short period of time. So, after a certain substrate concentration, any further increase does not increase the rate of enzyme catalysis, as the active site is permanently occupied. And that's it. You now know everything you need to know about proteins and enzymes for the IB Biology exam. We hope you enjoyed the third video in our IB Biology Topic 2 video series. Check out our notes, flashcards and questions on our website to reinforce your understanding from this video.